This video investigates some of the underlying conditions required to develop a suitable metric to describe the space-time surrounding a uniformly rotating mass. It particularly focuses on the slow speed and weak field case before going on to look at the frame dragging effect that results from a rotating mass. Now this video is the first in a series on the Kerr metric. So let's say we have a spherical-like distribution of mass that is uniformly rotating. And we seek a metric g mu nu that describes the space-time outside this mass. All right, so given the axial symmetry of the situation, we choose to start with the coordinates ct, r, theta, and phi. So four dimensions. Now, stationary space-time is one for which all the components of the metric g mu nu are independent of t. And this means the space-time outside the mass does not change over time. So the partial derivative of the metric with respect to the time coordinate is zero. Now, an axially symmetric space-time is one in which for all the components of g mu nu are independent of the angle involved, which in this case is phi. And this means the space-time outside the mass does not change when moving in the phi direction. So again, the partial derivative of the metric with respect to the phi coordinate is zero. So we have two conditions here, this one and this one, where the metric is independent of the components t and phi, because the partial derivative of the metric with respect to each of these coordinates is zero. All right, so that means together we have two killing vectors, one for each of the two directions, the t direction and the phi direction. Now, a metric has some form like this, four by four, it's in four dimensions, symmetric, of course, and it's going to be made up of, it will be functions of r and theta, the other two coordinates, not phi and t. The line element, ds squared, is the metric times each of these differentials. <coughs> Now, this space-time is invariant under the simultaneous transformation of t to minus t, so under time reversal, and under direction, the angle phi reversed, so phi to minus phi. Now, this is due entirely to the axial symmetry and the stationarity in the phi and t directions, because remember, the metric was independent of the phi and t directions because of the symmetry in both of these directions. So under time reversal of t, minus c dt, and, time, and uh, re direction reversal of phi, d phi, minus d phi, gives us c dt, d phi. So that's fine. So c dt, d phi, and so that tells us that g03 and g30, that's this component of the metric and this component, are not equal to zero because they <clears throat> are invariant under reversal. All right, but no such symmetries exist for combinations of pairs of coordinates other than these two. And that means we can rule out some other cross terms in the metric. Now we can have under time reversal, the t to minus t gives us minus c dt, and t to minus t gives us minus c dt, multiply those together, and it's the same as if both were positive. So under time reversal, that term there's allowed. We're, we've already seen that. But let's try some other combinations, like let's say the combination of T and R. We're looking to rule out some cross terms here. So time reversal of T gives us this. If R is not reversed, then what we find is that this does not equal C dt dr. And so we can rule out this cross term, C dt dr. Uh, <clears throat> if we didn't rule it out, we'd produce a line element like this. ds squared is this bit, which is time reversal is fine. No problems here with this part of the expression. But over here, we get a positive here, whereas under time reversal, this gives us a negative. And so this can't be allowed because it means the line element then is not invariant. And so certain combinations of cross terms can be ruled out. Minus C dt d theta can, can be ruled out. d theta d phi can be ruled out. dr d phi can be ruled out. And so that tells us that g01, g02, g23, and g13 are all zero because it's not possible, we can't have those. They're not invariant under reversal of the coordinates. <clears throat> okay, our line element is now, because the only um, coordinates that for which we can accept reversal is the time and the phi. We can't for r, d phi, uh, d phi we can, sorry. We can't for, DR, for r and theta. 
And so these cross terms have to be ruled out as a result. All right, so our line element is now, we've now reduced it down quite a bit. G00, C squared dt squared, plus this cross term here, as we've seen, is allowed, plus this bit here, G33 d5 squared, and then we have G11 dr squared, G12 dr d theta, plus G22 d theta squared. Um, now, we don't know about r and theta, as far as we know that uh, we know those coordinates, so we don't expect to ha have time rever uh, directional reversal with those. So, but we can just we just need to check, and there's also another way we can rule those two out um, because this combination didn't involve either a t or a phi, which can be reversed. So we can't be sure if minus dr times minus d theta gives us plus dr times d theta. So, but there's another way we can come at that, and we can rule out this term here. And what we're going to do for that is the metric coefficient, Jimmy, and you're all functions of r and theta, and the part of the line element in parentheses is the line element of a separate two-dimensional sub-manifold. So we have this part here, and then we have this bit here, which is a two-dimensional manifold, r and theta, g11, g12, g22, and there's some interesting property. So we can write that as this first line here, this part here, g00, g03, and g33. We know that with these, time reversal is allowed. Uh, and then we can have this G alpha beta bit over here. Now, what we know is that with any two-dimensional pseudo-Riemannian manifold, is conformally flat, which means there exists some omega, which is a function of the coordinates of the manifold, such that G alpha beta can be expressed as a flat space metric in the form. And this applies for any two-dimensional pseudo-Riemannian manifold. And we can write the metric, G alpha beta, as omega squared as a function of the coordinates of the manifold, in this case, R and theta, uh, times the flat space metric here. Eta alpha beta is one, zero, zero, one. And this has reduced G alpha beta to a diagonal form. The exact form of that diagonal, we don't really need to know. We don't really need to know what this is over here. We just know that we can reduce it to a diagonal form. If we can reduce it to a diagonal form, that's this submanifold here, then this term must go. Whatever it is, it must be zero. All right, we don't yet know what these are, or, or G22 or G11, but we know we can get rid of that one. <clears throat> and that's even without knowing the form of omega squared. All right, so our new line on becomes G00, which is TT, RR, which was 1, 1, theta, theta, which is 2, 2, the cross term T5, and G33 or G55. All right, now whatever the final form of the metric, it must reduce to the Schwarzschild metric when the rotation disappears. So we can make this rotating mass stop, uh, stop rotating, then uh, this cross term here must disappear and this whole thing must reduce down to the Schwarzschild metric. So the Schwarzschild line element is this object here. All right, um, now in the case of a slowly rotating mass in the weak field approximation, we can imagine a correction to the Schwarzschild metric to give a new line element to describe this case in the form of this here. And that can be written as this, this extra cross term added here with these components out here. And MAC can be, is the angular momentum. And, well, it can be written like this. All right, so mass, speed of light, angular speed here, rotation speed A. Now, this is known as the lens steering uh, term. This last term on the end there was the lens steering one, which describes a dragging of inertial frames and is valid to first order only in the angular momentum. So the angular momentum J was MAC. So <clears throat> our metric in this case is this object here. The J here is the angular momentum, right? Now, it's not my intention here in this video to derive the lens steering effect because I'm looking to go on to the Kerr metric, but it's just a starting point that I can use in an argument towards generating the Kerr metric, which will occur in the video after this. Now from Newtonian theory, a body of mass M and moment of inertia I rotating with angular speed omega has an angular momentum J is approximately the moment of inertia times the angular speed, which is approximately M R squared omega and approximately M R V. V is R times omega and is the speed of rotation. All right, now just have a look at that. This bit here, 4GJ on C cubed R, that bit there is made up of the product of two terms. This familiar mass 
related dependence that we've seen in the Schwarzschild metric up here and here, right? And then times this factor V on C, where the last factor shows the dependence of the curvature of the space time on the mass. This is the mass part, and the rotation speed is this part here. So <clears throat> the metric to describe the space time for a slowly rotating mass in a weak field is dependent on the mass and the speed of rotation. So the space time, in Schwarzschild case, the space time dependent on the mass of the object, and then of course how far away you were from it. This has got the mass and of course how far away you are from it, that's the one over R there. But it's also got this factor of the speed. So the space time is outside this rotating mass will be affected by the speed of rotation, not just the mass. And that's the point here. All right, next bit. Now note that when this 2gm on c squared r is much less than 1, and we have the weak field case, so we can make an approximation that this thing here, which is also equal to this, is approximately this. And that happens when m is small, or r is large, or both conditions are true. So if you look at m is small, or r is large, or both, then you have this condition where this is less than 1, much less than 1. Now this leads to the following form of the weak field approximation for a slowly rotating mass. Notice that this should have been in the Schwarzschild case minus 1, and then plus this bit on the end here, the length steering effect, um, and now we're just going to replace that with this bit here. And we'll use that in the future in the video following this one. All right, now so back to our rotating mass. A particle with four velocity is allowed to freely fall in towards the mass. And we know this metric has two killing vectors such that along geodesics followed by a given particle, we have this condition that d d lambda of the killing vector dotted with the um, scalar product with the um, uh, four velocity gives us zero. Now, one of the killing vectors we saw earlier was in the phi direction, and we can write that as components here and basis vector d d phi. So components there. And the form meant of the particle based on its four velocity u is p is m zero u, and that's this object here. And what we're going to have a look at next bit is in this geometry the angular momentum component component of the form momentum. So we're looking for this one here, is conserved along its geodesic. So let's apply the condition we just saw on the previous slide, d d lambda of this for a killing vector k. We'll substitute in here, k is this object here, dot product, scalar product, here we go, this bit here, and what it does is these zeros here make this bit disappear, and so it picks out the fourth component in the phi direction, so we have here, um, when we do this uh, scalar product, we get g phi phi from the metric, uh, the component one, times this component of the form momentum of the particle, P phi, and d d lambda of all of that. And that's d d lambda. Now notice this metric term here will lower this component. So we get the covariant component, and d d lambda, the covariant component, is zero. And that tells us the, co the covariant component is constant. So in the phi direction, the covariant component of the form momentum is equal to constant, it's fixed. All right, next bit. For this geometry, uh, we have two killing vectors and a metric of the form, so he's reminding us of our metric again. Now, the contravariant time, con upper component, contravariant, upper component, and azimuthal components of the form momentum are, so the azimuthal is this one, and the time component is this one. These, these are the contravariant time component, the contravariant azimuthal component here. Okay, we can write that as this expression here, which is a sum of terms, and we sum over alpha, so in this case, t, t, and phi, phi. All right, and what we have here, and uh, similarly for the t component, we sum over alpha here, so it's g, t, t, p, t, plus g, t, phi, p, phi. And now, let's say we release our particle from rest, so initially, at the moment in time, its initial uh, form momentum is uh, zero from rest, and far from the source mass. So its initial, uh, initially, it has the form momentum component, covariant component, in the phi direction of zero. So it's released from rest along its geodesic. Remember, this thing freely falling will follow geodesics, whether it's a particle or a photon, it will follow the geodesics of the space-time. 
and the components of its form momentum that are constant along the geodesic that it moves along are, so we have a look at the contravariant time component is this object here, which is this, and the contravariant component of the um, form momentum in the phi direction is this object here, which we can write as that. Now these two quantities allow us to form the result of d phi on c d t, which is d phi on d of c t, phi component, time component. Now the um, m0 d phi d tau, um, those here and d tau over m0 c d t, those here m0s will cancel out, um, the d tau's cancel out, and we're left with d phi on c d t, which is p phi on p t, um, and if you looked on the previous slide, if you stop the video and just go back, you see you can verify yourself that's g phi t on g t t. And we know that the components of our metric will be functions of r and theta only, not t and phi. So we have some expression, some function omega of r and theta. So something's happening here. Now here, omega is the coordinate angular velocity that is acquired by the particle, so it picks it up, um, as it moves along its geodesic, which means it is freely falling. So geodesics, remember, it's freely falling, it's released from rest, it follows the geodesics. There's no outside forces or actions on it. It just responds to the curvature of space-time, so it follows geodesics. Even though it started from rest far from the source of mass m, all right? So it now has some angular velocity. Even though we released it from rest, as it moves, it acquired some when it didn't have any. All right. Now, the fact this particle is following a geodesic means that the space-time curvature and the source mass must be curved, such that the particle acquires an angular velocity in the same direction as the source mass, which is, so it's, it's, it has the same uh, direction of angular velocity as the source mass does. Now, this effect is called the dragging of frames. The fact that this is not zero tells you that the space-time around this mass is curved in some way, and the particle following geodesics must follow this expression here, which is non-zero. Uh, let's just have a look at the photons before I give you a diagram of this. So in the case of photons, we have some, in some inertial frame, a four velocity is given by this. Right. This uh, derivative with respect to lambda, this is not proper time because photons don't have zero proper time. So it's some other uh, variable, affine variable. And we have u dot u is zero for a photon. The four velocity dotted with itself is zero. Now the form mentioned this photon, some arbitrary frame is given by p alpha u is alpha of these components here. And we can write that as this here for, for, a, um, for a photon, that'll be this. Now, when we, we again release a photon in the direction of the source mass with zero initial angular momentum components released from rest. So these components initially are zero it will acquire d phi d c d t, we will find this to be non-zero, it will be d phi d c t as alpha d phi d, alpha, d lambda, so alpha d phi d lambda, right, times the reciprocal of this object here, d c d alpha times alpha, so the alphas cancel here, the d lambdas cancel, we get this over this, which is p phi on PT, which again, G phi T on GTT. So whether it's a particle with mass or a photon, we still end up with some expression, some angular velocity here that is dependent on R and theta. And so this photon must move, rotate, must acquire an angular velocity in the direction of the rotating mass. Now, since fo photons follow the curvature of space time, they are a way to probe that space time and to determine the effect the given rotating mass uh, object with mass m has on that particular on on space time. Let's have a look at the diagram. So here we go. You can imagine off wherever you like, somewhere in the distance there, a photon or a mass is released from rest. It follows the space time. Notice that around the rotating mass, which is rotating counterclockwise here the space-time becomes curved. Now, both the particle with mass and the photon must follow the curvature of space-time, and so this space-time is curved, and the, uh, the particle, be it the photon or the mass, acquires some angular velocity in the direction of rotation. You can see how the space-time becomes curled very sharply as it gets closer and closer to the rotating mass. And this is the effect of frame dragging. 
All right, note that the direction of the angular velocity acquired by the particle, whether it be a particle with mass or a photon, is in the same direction as the rotation of source mass m. And here we go, source mass m. And that's it.